Okay, we're, we're back on now. I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker, Heather Cianci. Um, <clears throat> Heather is a geriatric clinical specialist and founding therapist of the Dan Aaron Parkinson's Rehabilitation Center, Good Shepherd Penn Partners at Pennsylvania Hospital in um, Philadelphia. She received her bachelor's in physical therapy from the University of Scranton and her master's in gerontology from St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. Heather's specialty is working with uh, uh, Parkinson's disease, PSP, CBD, MSA patients. She is a certified LSVT big certified clinician. She'll tell you all about that. And a graduate of the National Parkinson's Foundation Allied Team Training Program. Heather is a member of the Cure PSP board as well as the chair of uh, Cure PSP's medical advisory committee and a former PSP support group leader for the University of Pennsylvania's Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center. She has been working with Cure PSP for the past 10 years. Okay, Heather? Is it still morning so I can still say good morning again? And uh, thank you to Dr. Golby. He stole a little bit of my thunder with my exercises, so I don't have to do that for you now, but we might do a little bit of it later. So I want to preface my talk with saying that I could talk up here all day about each condition and all the things we should do and things we can do and options that are available, but unfortunately we only have a half an hour, and I've kind of condensed everything down into a, a must-know portion. But I'm going to leave my phone number and my email here if people have individual questions, um, specific things that you want to find in your own communities, please let us know. Quickly, I'd like to get a feel for where people are from. How many people are from Pennsylvania? Great. And New Jersey? New York? Great. Anybody from Delaware? Anybody from somewhere I didn't name? We got the three. Florida. All right. You get the prize for longest distance. Great, because I'm going to talk a little bit about different services that you can find in your own communities. So the topic of, of this discussion today is maximizing your functional independence. So it's a quote that we use constantly in our clinic, and that is, think before you move. When you are diagnosed with these conditions, they make your body do things that it doesn't normally do. So you might have problems with tremoring, drop in blood pressure with the MSA, you have uncontrollable movements, movements that are incoordinated, you want to move your hand or your leg and it just doesn't do what you want it to do. And these conditions make you have difficulty doing things you normally do. So putting those two together, your movements sort of become what we kind of describe it as a run-on sentence. Everything becomes jumbled together. Dr. Golby talked about that rocket coming up out of the chair. That's a perfect example of it. That's all the different intricate movements that take care of getting up from a chair that we normally don't think about. We scoot to the edge of the chair. We lean forward. We push up with our hands. With these conditions like PSP and CBD and MSA, we just get up real quick, and that is that run-on sentence. So it's our goal as therapists to teach you to put that comma into your movement sentence. We need to teach you how to break down movements into smaller little one, two, three steps. And thinking about each thing before you do it is going to allow you to have that capability to perform things correctly. And the way I like to explain it to my patients is that these conditions don't necessarily take away your ability to do the movements, but they make them so difficult and so different that if you don't reapply a new technique, you will ultimately lose the ability. There is nothing as a physical therapist or an occupational therapist that we can't help you with. People have to be very accepting sometimes of needing more help, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the talk. So first thing I want to get across to you guys is your new mantra is think before you move, and we're going to talk next about how to do that. So getting in and out of bed. How many people here have difficulty with getting in and out of bed? Yeah. And turning over in bed, that's another difficult situation that people talk about. So I'll talk a little bit about some tips and tricks that you can do. Years ago, we used to tell everyone, put satin sheets on your bed, make everything nice and slippery. And then we had a lot of people sliding right out of bed. So we don't give that advice anymore. 
what we generally tell people to do is you keep a regular cloth or cotton flannel sheet as your fitted sheet and then you just fold in half a long satin sheet across the middle of the bed or wear satin pants so that your buttocks can slide nice and easily. The number one thing that we probably suggest the most is the bed rail. How many people in here are using bed rails? Okay, just a couple. You would be very surprised to find how easy it is to install one of these. They slide right in between your mattress and your box spring, and then it can afford you with great stability. Because not only can you use that to help you roll and turn, but once you're on a seated position on the edge of the bed, you have instant stability to hold on to to stand up. The bad thing about these with a lot of medical devices is they're not generally covered by insurance companies. I am going to refer you to a, an online source that we use a lot. I don't get paid to, to say their name or anything like that, but we've just found them to be very helpful in our clinic. Um, if you have a durable medical supply store near you, you can also look there. Getting up from a chair, this is probably one of the most difficult things for our clients. We talked about the rocket ship coming right up, but there's also a high percentage of our patients who fall back into the chair when they try to get up, or they press their legs against the back of the chair, and then the chair slides out from behind them. So if you are somebody who is having those difficulties with falling back in the chair, you're likely doing one of two things incorrectly. So the first one is you haven't moved far enough to the front of the chair. If you look at yourself right now when you're sitting in the chair, you've got all your weight from the back of your buttocks all the way to the crook of your knees that you have to lift that body mass. If you get the weight to the front part of the chair, now you only have the body mass of your buttocks to lift, and that's significantly lighter load to do. The other difficulty is, and if you look at the woman in this picture, she has not pushed forward enough. She's doing what I sort of refer to sometimes in the clinic as the pregnant lady stand. She's pushing up and kind of arching back to get herself out of the chair. If you don't get your nose and your trunk forward past your knees and your toes, the likelihood of you falling back in the chair is great. So we're going to teach you how to line everything up. This is the correct method. And for those of you who have been in therapy before, you may have heard our mantra, nose over toes. It really works. Most important thing there, first bringing that weight all the way to the edge of the chair, getting the nose over the toes, but equally as important is looking down at your feet. If you don't pre-plan the position where your feet are, typically in these conditions your feet will come very close together and you'll have a narrow base of support. And that's going to set you up for instability once you're standing. So making sure that the knees and the feet are very wide apart and that the feet are underneath of you. And when you do that and you lean forward, it lifts your buttocks up, and then you're able to stand. Getting into the chair is also a difficult thing. How many people in here suffer from freezing, where their feet get stuck to the ground, or they start to shuffle, and then they just can't move the rest of the body? A couple of people. A lot of our patients have difficulty with getting into the chair, even without freezing. When someone has a balance problem or they feel incoordinated and they're walking and they go to get to the chair, their automatic reaction is, I just want to get into that chair. And they forget about the correct way to walk. And they don't think about the whole position that their body needs to be in before they sit. And as this woman is doing in the picture here, people often reach for the chair far too soon and far too far away from when they want to sit down. So again, you're doing two things incorrectly, reaching before you're turning and you're not taking full large steps. The really, the rule is the only time you're able to reach for a chair is reaching back when the chair is behind you. When you reach like this, if you think about it, if you're standing just on your own and you reach too far forward, where does it displace the weight? It brings the weight forward onto the balls of your feet, up onto your toes, and causes you to fall forward. And that's what happens when you do this. And then people do a quick turn and they flop in the chair and they tip the chair sideways or they catch the edge of the chair and they don't land correctly. We see a lot of people who fall from this. There are a couple of options out there. One is the motorized lift chair. As a physical therapist, we're always promoting people to be as independent as possible. But at some point in your disease process, if you cannot manage this on your own, then we always look to this motorized option. It's a one-touch button. It helps to lift you up to stand. The motor portion of the chair is covered by Medicare, but the chair itself is not covered. Medicare can be very tricky. Some of the other insurance companies have different rules for this. Usually I have a, a lot of patients who will tell me they got one at a thrift store or they found one in the classifieds. You can often find good medical equipment that's lightly used on Craigslist. A lot of my clients will find things from that. The handy bar. This is our new favorite thing. 
Getting in and out of the car can be very troublesome just because of the inability to coordinate all the fine little movements that you have to do with turning and pushing and grabbing. And when you're in a car, there's not too much to hold on to. This handy little device hooks, and you can see it there in the picture. Let me see if I can get my pointer working. Right here, the little hook where the car door would normally close onto, this portion of the handy bar hooks into it and gives you support on that side to lift up from. Now, one thing I will caution you against, and I have to talk to the handy bar people, we never recommend that you hold onto the door of the car. The door of the car can move, and if it moves, you're moving with it. Usually what we recommend is that you hold onto the dashboard or you hold onto the hand of someone who's with you. Now, when you call the handy bar company there and you go on the website, they don't directly sell their product. They're going to guide you to other places that do sell them. You can do a simple search on Google or Yahoo and find it for probably under $40. Preventing backwards falls. Usually patients with PSP, the number one risk is they're falling backwards. Standing still, turning in the kitchen, making small turns in the bathroom, areas where you have lots of tight little areas to negotiate can be really tricky. So one thing that we do all the time and we take people into our model kitchen is teaching people how to do what we call the power stance. And what that means is you have your feet separated, nice and large, but then you also have them sort of in a staggered stance, so one foot is a little bit more ahead. If you just have a wide stance, you have good side-to-side -side support, but you don't have good front-to-back support. So if you stagger the feet and have them wide, then you have four directional control with that. A lot of people opening the refrigerator door, opening the oven, standing in front of a closet, will open it up and then travel backwards and fall back. If you're in this position, it can help to stabilize you so that you're nice and wide and tight, and then the movement can be done with your upper body, not your lower body. Rollators. There are a million different rollators out there, and I did see one U-step rollator who's out here in the audience who is a company that we use a lot of, and unfortunately I don't have their picture. Um, but unfortunately a lot of these devices are not covered by the medical insurance companies. They aren't covered by Medicare. We order them usually from an online place. You can go to medical supply stores as well. The beauty of these type of devices is they give you a different kind of stability. You've got the brakes to hold on to. You also have the ability to sit down if you fatigue. Now this walker is not made for everybody. There are people who need to have stability on the back of the walker to slow them down because some people do feel like the walker gets away from them. There are walkers called reverse braking walkers. So that type of walker, you squeeze the handles to make it roll and you let go of it to make it break. And those sometimes are a wonderful help for people. The U-Step Rollator is a large, heavy-duty walker that really helps people who have problems with the uncontrolled movements, the ataxic movements, who feel very imbalanced. It's also good for people who are on the tall side. The one caveat that I'm going to give you down there at the bottom is don't just go out and buy a walker, though. Make sure you're assessed by a physical or occupational therapist to make sure it's the right thing. A lot of people will get a walker from a family member who had a hip replacement or a knee replacement. It may not be the right size walker. It may not be the right type of wheel. You know, we're really looking as physical therapists to get you a type of walker that is great for all surfaces. We want you to be able to get outside. We want you to be able to go to the movies. We want you to be able to go out for a walk on grass, on your carpet, on sidewalks. So you really want the kind of wheel that's going to handle all those different terrains. Oh, I do have the U-Step walker. I forgot. So this is the U-Step. It gives you a better picture of that there. The nice thing also about this walker is it has a laser beam option where you can push a button on the handle and it projects a laser beam across in a horizontal manner so that as you're pushing the walker, it gives you a cue as to where to place your foot and how to step over to keep that forward motion going. This is covered by Medicare. Dr. Golby mentioned a little bit earlier uh, the condition of this frontal problems with these, with PSP and CBD and MSA, where people may not have the greatest safety awareness, or even though they have a balance problem, they choose to get up. And sometimes the care partner will say to me, oh, I feel like such a nag. I keep telling them not to get up, and I keep telling him to stay put, or I tell her to just sit there and call me. And sometimes the person with the condition just doesn't feel like they want to trouble their partner also and try to get up. There are people who truly are at higher risk of falling because of their 
decrease in their safety awareness and their judgment. And if we want to decrease those falls risks, sometimes we need to go the way of a, a wheelchair alarm. Now, it's just not for wheelchairs. You can hook them onto any chair. But basically, what it is is a computerized mat. It's a pressure-sensitive mat where people sit on it. If they get up from the mat, an alarm can go off. There's also the option of having a voice recording. So you can record your own voice so that when the per person tries to get up, they hear your voice saying, OK, Charlie, sit down. I'll be right there. Or please don't move. I'll be with you in just a minute. Remember what I told you. Hold on to the chair. So little reminders to help people with that. Again, unfortunately, this item is not covered by insurance. I've given you the name of the Posey Company, and they're just one of the companies out there who have these type of devices. These can also be for helpful for people who get up in the middle of the night who can fall on their own. You can also place that pad in the middle of the bed. So falling protection that you can actually put onto your body. Again, the Posey Company sells these. They actually did a nice study. It wasn't particular to the Parkinsonism diseases, but there was an NIH study that showed that people who fall chronically were less likely to fracture a hip by wearing these pads. So the picture on the bottom shows you the biker short. It has the pads already sewn into them. They've now upgraded. They have them now with the pretty, you know, modestly good-looking pants there, different colored sweatpants, where they're already sewn into them there, so you just slip it on. So what it does is just affords you a little more cushioning on a very serious bony prominence on there. And we know that people who fall and fracture the hip are much less likely to return to their full functional capacity when they have an underlying condition such as PSP. You also can do knee and elbow pads. For people who are falling, those are something that you can just buy over the counter. You can buy them at sporting goods stores. And Dr. Golby also mentioned earlier the torticolysis. So there's two conditions that we see a lot of in this population, and one is anticollis, where the chin falls forward and down onto the chest. And in that kind of situation, Botox is not very helpful. Dr. Golby talked about that if we Botox the front of the neck, to help those muscles that are too tight, we risk hurting some of the swallowing centers. So for patients who are having difficulty with holding the head up, there are different neck braces that are available. People use a lot of the soft collar braces, and that might be good for a comfortable short period of time, but if you want true stability in holding that neck up, this is one of the options that are out there. This is the Headmaster device, and it fits under the jawline. The difficult thing, although it has many pluses, that it's not very bulky, you can wear it in warmer weather and not feel so hot, you can't eat or talk very well because it presses your jaw up into this position. So you do have to take it off if you're going to have a conversation or you're going to have meal time. For patients who need a little more support, there are special devices that go onto wheelchairs. Now, you couldn't hook this onto just a normal chair. This would be somebody who is in a wheelchair. This is the company that's on there. And it's a really nice device because it's just a head strap. A lot of times, people cannot get enough support just at the jawline, and they need that pullback support to keep the head up. And it's basically a strap that goes over the forehead and then pulled back behind them. For people who can't tolerate that, they sell a cap version where it's like a baseball cap, and then it pulls from the sides. So I've given you the information on there. They use it a lot for people who are still you know, in classrooms, people who want to watch television, meal time. It's wonderful. Again, better posture when you're eating, when you're speaking, helps for the better protection of the airway and for your enunciation and all of those good things. The Association of Assisted Technology Act programs. This is a wonderful program. The program in Pennsylvania is called PIAT, P-I-A-T, and that's the Pennsylvania Institute for Assistive Technology, and that's run out of Temple University, but there are organizations in every state. So they give you devices for everything from helping to make your computer easier to handle, making typing easier, helping you to read in a better way, magnifying objects, helping you to hold a deck of cards, helping you to change the lights in your home, anything that you can think of that you want to enjoy still doing, they have a device that can help you with that. The nice thing about Temple's program, for at least in Pennsylvania, is they have a lending library, so they will give people these devices, let you try them in your home before you actually purchase them. So I've given you the phone number and all the website on there. You can click onto the link and it will take you to that site for your state, and then you can find out what's available in your community. 
So talking a little bit more about assistive technology as we grow more and more comfortable with smartphones and different digital devices, there's a whole world of possibilities that are opening out there for people that really were not available just five to ten years ago. One of them on there is Able Data, and that's going to give you all the information about different products that are on there. You can type in, I'm having difficulty reading, or I'm having difficulty picking up my, my spoon and lifting it to my mouth, and they're going to guide you through different devices that are out there. The second one, RESNA, that's the Rehabilitation, Engineering, and Assisted Technology Society of North America. These are the people that you go to if you want to get a specialized wheelchair or scooter. These are PTs and OTs who have been trained specially to make measurements, to make sure that you fit correctly in your wheelchair, that you have the back support that you need, that you have pressure relief cushions, that you can operate the joystick or the steering wheel on your device. Wonderful organization. And then disability.gov, and that's going to tell you a little bit about your housing options, health care, disability things for people who are still working. What are your rights as someone who's still out there? What are your rights as somebody who's going out to a restaurant that's not handicap accessible? It's going to lead you through all those NASA. Music and dance. So before I talk a little bit about this, I'm going to give you the caveat of a conference that I went to a number of years ago, and a physician from the Never Netherlands was talking about her idea of what exercise was and what people can do. And she used the quote that adults work out and children play. And that really stuck with me. And I took that home because I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old. And there are days that I don't actually work out, but there are days when I've played for a long time. And if we think about what do children do to stay active, it's constant motion. They laugh, they run, they wave their arms, they move around. They're always doing something. And I thought about, well, how can we put this in to a, a different kind of perspective for people? We're, we're trained as physical and occupational therapists to tell you, you need to do this stretch and you need to do this strengthening exercise. And I want you to stand on one leg and I want you to be careful. But the truth of the matter is, is how do we get the message home to make it fun so that people are going to do it, so that people are going to enjoy it. We're not going to do something that we don't enjoy. And there are wonderful, wonderful studies out there, at least in the world of Parkinson's disease, with respect to music and dance, how it affects different parts of the brain, how it can be a motivational tool for people, how certain beats of music stimulate the body to react different ways. And what I tell a lot of my patients is, Bring in a list of music that you like. Bring in a CD. Burn a CD. Bring me a playlist of music you like. It might not be music I like, but I want to know what you listen to and you're going to enjoy, and then we're going to develop an exercise program around that music. Music therapists are out there. If you go onto the website, they talk about wonderful things like promoting wellness, managing stress, pain relief, enhancing your memory. A lot of people may not be able to remember necessarily new, fresh information that is told to them now, but if you ask about a dance that they met their partner at 50 years ago, or their first high school dance, or what was the song you danced to at your wedding, a lot of memory retrieval things can be based around music. So don't discount the wonderful power of music. And I challenge everybody to go home today, and even if you can't stand because balance is a problem, you can get a great workout by just sitting down and moving your body in the chair to a good upbeat song. So same thing with dance and movement therapy. Now my picture dropped down a little bit there. But again, that's going to help to promote emotional, cognitive, physical, and social interaction. We have a lot of patients. I have a woman right now who she has a pretty serious condition, and they think it may be a combination of actually PSP, MSA, and CBD all together. And she has a lot of deficits right now. And we're having a hard time in physical therapy getting her moving. We got her hooked up with the Arthur Murray School of Dance, and she has one-on-one -on -one training with an instructor. She absolutely loves it. And now we have her working one day a week with pet therapy. And for a hand that had difficulty in moving and opening, it's amazing how she will release her grasp and relax when she is petting that therapy dog. So again, thinking out of the box as to what can be promoting wellness and happiness in your life is a very important thing. So I've given you the website there also of the American um, Dance and Movement Therapy Organization. Staying active in your home. Maybe it's not realistic that you're going to get out to a gym. Maybe it's not realistic that you're going to go out there five times a week. Wonderful technology. Anybody in here using the Wii? Oh. Xbox? 
That's a little more newer cutting edge. So the Wii, you have to hold a device and the computer screen manages what you do. The Xbox has little cameras and feeds back information to you. They have dancing, they have bowling, they have tennis. They've done a wonderful study on people with Parkinson's disease doing tennis, boxing, and bowling. And these were people who were wheelchair bound and they found that those people improve their mobility just from the seated exercises. So if you think about PSP and CBD and MSA, you usually have one side of the body that's a little bit harder to move than the other. And those reciprocal movements of boxing, of dancing, of doing tennis, big, large movements, because these conditions make your world small. They make your movements smaller, they make things tighter, they make it harder to get around, they limit your world so that you don't go to a lot of places and your world becomes smaller. We really want to use the different devices that are out there to make our world larger, to make our movements larger, to make things more fluid with your movement. So. Father's Day is coming up. You might want to ask for that. Graduations, all sorts of things. Get the family to pool together. Um, you can go to a lot of different fitness centers. They have them. Maybe try it out and see what you think. But I really would recommend something to get motivated. So acknowledging your limitations. This can be a real problem for a lot of people. And I think it's a problem for most people in general, just as we're aging, because we have differences and changes that happen in our body, even without a disease process. You lose 1% of your muscle mass per year over the age of 60 just by growing older. So there are things that are happening to us that are underlying our disease processes that we have to take care of anyway. So you really need to be care, you know, honest and careful and explicit with your care partner, with your doctor, with your therapist. The golden rule for do you need a device to help you if you're holding on to furniture, if you're touching a wall, if other people are reaching out to hold you, you probably need a device to help you, all right? You can't get around by just touching onto everything that isn't stable. That's not gonna provide you with the support you need. The other rule is, is if you land on anything other than your feet, it's a fall. I have a lot of people falling and the number of falls in patients with these conditions is really underreported. A, I think people are embarrassed to talk about the falls. A lot of times people don't want to tell their care partner or their loved one that they are falling because they're worried that they're going to need more help and they're going to lose their independence. And a lot of people don't really understand what a fall is. I had a woman tell me the other day, well, it wasn't really a fall. I just landed on my mother-in-law on the couch. And I thought, it's still a fall. You know, you have to really be cognizant of this. We really try to explain to our clients that you need to keep a fall log because you want to look for any kind of pattern. Do you fall every time you get out of the chair? Is it usually in the kitchen? Is it late at night? Is it when you're getting out of bed? And see if you can come up with the pattern of when you're most likely to fall. And then you can talk to your doctor and your therapist about that and they can put forth a plan to help you with that. The other thing is physical therapist I talked about in the beginning was think before you move. Well, some people just aren't able to generate that memory or that recall of the knowledge that we teach them. So it's really important to acknowledge, hey, I'm having trouble remembering these things. I need more help. So sometimes we need to post notes around the house. We need to have those bed safety alarms. There is some degree of what we call apathy in PSP and the other conditions where people just don't sort of care anymore and things don't worry them as much as they worry the care partners. And that can be very disconcerting and frustrating to care partners. So we really need to be honest with one another about what our limitations are and asking for help. So I'm gonna stop here. That's my part of the presentation and we're gonna jump right into Christine who's our occupational therapist. Richard is going to introduce her. And then when we're done that, we'll have our panel. So if you have specific questions about PT and OT and movement things, we can talk about that. Thank you.